Hi everybody, welcome to Sprague Wood Turning. My name is Jim. If you haven't been here before, this is predominantly a turning channel where I make things on the lathe each and every week. And this week we're going to be using some black walnut and some of these awesome sweet gum pods. Now these look really cool when they're cast in resin, so we're going to do a little combination with the walnut and the sweet gum pods. And we're going to use a color that resin casters are scared to use, including me, and that's yellow. Really bright yellow to go with this walnut and these sweet gum pods. All right, let's move over to the, uh, the casting bench and then uh, we'll go from there. All right, so this is the bucket that we're going to be using. And this, the thicker piece is going to be the base. So what I want to do is glue this in place so that it's not going to move around. And we'll use some Starbond medium to do that. I'm trying to give you a better view there. So anyway, these came from Donna. And uh, thanks again for that, Donna. I really do appreciate it. And what I did was when they first got here, I put them in my toaster oven for an hour, 350, to dry them out and to, uh, to kill any critters that may be inside of them, because we certainly don't want any of that. And um, I must say that they were, uh, seemed to be a fair bit of sand in them. That's what it seemed like anyway. So anyway, I put, the, put them inside this container and shook them a lot. And uh, it really removed a lot of material because usually these sweet gum pods are a lot more spikier than this. But uh, anyway, they still look very cool and I can't wait to see how this thing turns out. Hopefully it turns out. First off, I'd like to thank you for stopping in and watch this uh, video and I do upload every Friday morning at 9 a.m. and uh, I do premieres that way people can get on there and we use the live chat function to talk about that week's project. All right I know you can't really see very much but that's just the way that it's got to be for now. Let's mix up some resin. This week we're going to be using deep casting epoxy from designer epoxy it's a perfect choice for this project uh this is too deep to be using a one-to-one -one. uh it definitely would thermal crack if we did and of course the lemon yellow so as you watch me put this into the uh the epoxy here <laughs> i never even noticed it but i was doing the voiceover and i looked at the footage from the opening and there was a little piece of sweet gum pod in my beard from cleaning them prior to shooting the video <laughs> and then it fell onto my shirt. Never even seen it. We may darken that up a little more but we're going to be using the hyper shift again. So this should be really neat in here. Hoping it's going to be. And this is the purple, blue and green. I've used yellow in the past. Uh, usually only with walnut, but you certainly could, uh, if you're using, say, white oak or red oak, it would probably go well with that. But I typically stay away from lighter colored woods because I just, the, the color contrast isn't there for me. I'm pretty sure that that's not going to do it. We'll probably have to do maybe one more. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've never mixed hyper shift with yellow yet, so should be interesting. Looks cool. There, that should give it enough tension so it's not going to move around. All right, this is a liter and a half, and I have no idea if it's going to be enough. Yep, I'll give it another liter and a half because uh, we're going to throw this in the vacuum chamber, and I know that that level's going to drop. I'll bring it back when that's ready. 
Here's another liter and a half. A whole little bit of that in reserve so we can fill it up if we need it. All right, vacuum chamber coming up next. All right, there should be lots of air coming out of this. So I need to cover this again because I'm still getting lots of emails and questions about it. And the question is, do you need a pressure pot or a vacuum chamber for resin casting? And the answer is no. If you have either one of them or both of them, it will give you a superior casting. But no, it is not necessary. You could pour the resin in this piece, set it on the bench, and it will cure. And the, the only issue is that possibly if there's some cracks in the wood, it's not going to get filled in. And in this case, with the sweet gum pods, there's probably going to be lots of uh, bubbles or voids inside of those if you don't use the vacuum chamber and the pressure pot. Well, the vacuum chamber is probably the biggest one. And that's another question that I get all the time, too. Of the two, which one do I feel is the most important? And I believe it's the vacuum chamber. You can cycle this on and off for two hours uh, because DeepCast has that long open time. Set it on the bench and it probably will be perfectly fine. If you have a pressure pot combined with the vacuum chamber, you will get a much better casting, but it's not necessary. All right, that's about... Uh... According to the gauge, 28 inches of vacuum. I can't pull any more of that because it's just going to overflow. So anyway, I'm going to keep cycling this on and off and then um, I'll bring in when we're ready to put it in the pressure pot. Well, that's been uh, 45 minutes and I still can't leave this running. It just keeps overflowing. So uh, I think that we've probably achieved our goal of filling in all of those pods. Yeah, that's the whole reason for doing this. So anyway, let's release the vacuum and I'll get this in the fresh pot. Anyway, we've got some floaties in here, so I'm going to pick those out and then this will go in the pressure pot. See you guys in three days. <sighs> Look, we made uh, lemon filling. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's three days later. Um, looks like we're going to have quite a bit of resin on the top of this, but you know, if you didn't put that much in, you'd be short. That's just the way it goes. So the last thing on vacuum chambers and pressure pots, if you're working with the one-to-one -one resin, it typically has a shorter open time. So what I like to do is typically pour that into the casting when it's still nice and liquidy and then get it into the pressure pot and that will push it into all those areas and skip the vacuum chamber. Well, that's a problem. I need to cut that off so I can get this out. Now, if I had used a mold release here, this certainly probably would have come out a lot easier. But in the past, I have used mold release and it didn't work so well. Uh, I think this is where a paste wax is superior to a lot of these. I think if this paste wax, and really you can use any paste wax, uh, will prevent these pieces from sticking in here. Especially this bucket, it's a little on the old side. Well, the hypershift looks cool down here. Hmm. This is going to be interesting. This is going to be one of those pieces that you either love or you absolutely hate. <laughs> That's the way this piece is going to go, I think. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, we got a center there. I'll have to grind this down or knock it out. Hopefully, I can knock it out of there now. And, um, yeah, let's see if we can do that. The problem with this tuck tape is it's not really glued to the piece. So I might drill down through this for the center. Yeah. 
There, we're down to good solid wood there, so this thing isn't going to go anywhere when it's on the lathe. That's all right. Starting off here with the number three Hercules from Hunter Tool Systems. Uh, last week's project was well received. Thank you so much for watching last week's uh, video. And if you haven't seen it, I will link it at the end of this video. But essentially, it's like an exploded bowl. And I was searching for, I didn't know the proper terminology for that. And then somebody mentioned it in the comments, and it's Boshin. It's the technique of, say, taking a human skull and pulling it apart and then connecting it together with wires. That's what I was trying to uh, really last week, but I just could not think of the name. And we're going to see a number of different variations of that in the future. Uh, <laughs> again, I when I made the suggestion of using a light wood and a dark wood and then cutting them up and mix and match in the pieces, uh, I was like, yeah, that's a great idea. And, and uh, along with that, I think what I'm going to do is actually maybe pour a resin bowl that's the same size and then cut that up and incorporate that with the two other bowls. So that would be a three bowl set. And, and the idea behind the resin one would be almost like stained glass windows if you're following so kind of interested to see how that would be received i'm, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sold on it yet <laughs> uh another variation of course could be walnut cherry and maple i mean really it's it's kind of whatever you've got you can use really it doesn't really matter the wood species but anyway, we're just going to strip off uh, the excess resin here and then we'll be able to stand back and get a look at it. I was just pointing out that I didn't like how small those were cause, so they weren't really exposed all that great. So I, I, I want to turn this down a little more so that at least those sweet gum pods, pods are a little larger than what they are right now. Another fitting name for last week's project would be the spiderweb bowl because it did, it did kind of give spiderweb vibes when you're looking at it, especially from uh, the, the back side of the bowl. Anyway, there's lots of things that we can do, different variations, and hopefully we'll see that soon. Well, it is decision time as to what we're going to do with this. Uh, this is gonna have to go because I've got that red piece in there or that piece that's covered in the tuck tape um, I'm gonna stick with this being the bottom I'm just gonna taper this off for now and I don't know we may possibly come in and do one of these numbers I'm not exactly sure yet probably the best form that would show this off is just a simple rounded over form and that's exactly what I might do uh, anyway, it's, I've struggled trying to figure out what to do with this and that's mostly because of the size of it. If this was larger in diameter, then it would be a no brainer for, to just do one of these, but it's not. Uh, I still think that, you know, it's all proportional. Uh, I might even turn a tenon on the bottom of this and use a tenon and not a glue block, <laughs> but, um, Anyway, it hasn't been easy to really kind of figure out the best way to, to use this. And I know that by going in, I'm going to expose these more like this. These are too obscured for me right now, where these are pretty much perfect. But of course, you know, the more you go in through here, then you're going to lose some of those too. But there should be some right behind them. Uh, anyway. It's something that I've struggled with uh, this week. And, but anyway, we'll round this off and then I guess we'll go from there. 
with all that said, <laughs> I know that by looking at this piece that, you know, it would make a good container. Uh, you could cut the very top of this off and then make kind of a lidded vessel. But, you know, I, I, I'm trying to stay away from utility pieces. I switched back to the gouge because it's all wood on the bottom and it's actually a lot faster than using the Hercules. Love my Hercules, but uh, when it comes to just working with straight wood pieces like this, I do prefer the gouge. After all, that's what I learned on. Sometimes I do struggle with coming up with design ideas and then, you know, I'll just do a Google search on hollow forms and, and try and get some inspiration there. So if you're if you're struggling with a project, uh, just do do a search on what you're working on and and they'll, you might be inspired by something that you see there. So I'm just going to keep working on this tenon and tenon size is certainly important. I with the chuck almost fully closed that's probably going to give you the most clamping pressure but the problem with that is maybe your tenons are going to be too small so when i'm incorporating tenons so there's a nice look at this still a little bit of ghosting on the top we're yeah right there so we need to get rid of that so you know when i'm working on pieces like this i typically will put or make the tenon about the midpoint of the chuck from being all the way open and being all the way closed. And you know, again, that really depends on the piece that you're working on. I probably could have got away with using a smaller tenon here just because this isn't a real large piece. So, you know, it's a funny thing. I was really struggling with a design to come up with for this. And as soon as I rounded off the bottom of this, it, it hit me that, yeah, like this, this here is a way, if we want to incorporate this resin top, which I, I'm more on the side of, it's, it's on its way out. And the main reason for that is because it doesn't match in color. Uh, if it matched in color, then I think that that would be really cool because you'd have two browns and then two of these that are the same color and it would give you a, a neat look, I think. But uh, you know, it just it just really said, yeah, like this is gonna be like a, a small little pot of some sort. Uh, you can take some battery powered lights and put it inside of it and it should shine through nicely. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna come in here a little more and, and dish this out and i think this is gone but it'd be interesting in the comments to see what you guys think but i'm getting rid of it. and the other thing too is this don't forget that we've got that spacer on the inside here so you know that's going to affect your design too how deep you can go in with your with your coves and you know there's all kinds of things that spacers like this where you save on resin but it can really really affect your design and this is why i typically don't do this stuff it's not going to be so much a factor with this piece but it certainly can be with a lot of pieces so as you watch me whittle this down to the outside form that i'm looking for uh we've got a bunch of new subscribers and and i probably should do this more often and basically give you a little bit of background on myself. So I'm actually Canadian and uh, I did 24 years in the Canadian Army, five years as uh, in the infantry with the Royal Canadian Regiment and then 19 as a mechanic, vehicle tech, EMI Corps. And uh, while I was serving, I was down at my wife's uncle's and he, he was a wood turner at the time and 
And uh, it just really, I was really attracted to wood turning. It was something that was completely different from what I was doing at the time in the military. And, and it, it was a good release for me to get away from the the stresses of the, the military, what it brings. And I was able to, um, to do that and also supplement my income. If you're curious what I'm doing with those resin shavings and holding on to them, hopefully we can recast those down, down the road here. So, you know, be, besides the fact of being a release as far as the day job was concerned, and, you know, I, I really needed a second income. The military at that time didn't pay very well. And uh, my wife and I have three kids, so, you know, it was, uh, I spent a lot of time at the lathe and developed my skills and started selling in consignment shops and uh, COVID hit. And when COVID hit, uh, of course, all of the shows, so I went from selling in in galleries to basically running the roads and doing juried art shows, uh, typically in the summer. And then, of course, the Christmas shows were, were probably my two big two big time frames that I would do shows, including the one of a kind show in Toronto. But uh, luckily, COVID hit. <laughs> and, you, and you won't hear too many people say that. So I didn't, all of these jury dart shows were shut down. So I didn't have an income coming in. I didn't have a real strong uh, online store and I certainly don't now because I uh, I'd sooner be turning than working on a computer it's it's last week I said I'd sooner be turning than cleaning but I'd also <laughs> sooner be turning than working on a computer and uploading videos or not videos but uh, photos of my work I I'm really envious of people that have a product that is all the same because they can just leave that up on their website and then over and over and over the sales come and it's not so much maintenance but of course when you're making one of a kind items like I am then you have to upload all that it sells you have to take it down upload and it uh, it can really be draining <laughs> especially when you know you've got three kids and you're married and you got other commitments as well so you know that's kind of why I never really had a strong online presence as far as an online store is concerned. But, uh, and now if I can't keep pieces in stock, which is great, it's good and it's bad because <laughs> I certainly could be making more money, but uh, I'm kind of at max production now and where I want to be in my life too. Like I'm, I'm 55 years old and, you know, I'm not getting any younger. So I'm trying to take a step back instead of uh, hammer down if you if you know what I mean. All right, we are all set up and ready for hollowing. This is the one-way captive system. You've seen me use it here a lot. There is my modified laser. And right now it's set at about five eighths of an inch, somewhere around there. Um, I could probably do this with the Hercules. My back is bothering me a little bit today, so I think this is probably a better option. Might end up switching to that later on. But for now, this is what we'll use. And I'm hoping to just use the straight boring bar. I think I've got enough movement here to do that. All right, let's see how we do. No steady rest, so wish me luck. So further to my last, uh, I am self-taught. Uh, all I've ever, I've never taken a lesson in person from anybody. Uh, Back before YouTube was even a thing, <laughs> I, um, I bought a lot of uh, books, books from Richard Raffin. He was probably one of my, one of the main guys that uh, I really liked watching his videos and reading his literature. Uh, anyway, there, there's a few, uh, so <laughs> uh, DVDs, VCRs, uh, and of course books. That's where I got my education tri in trial and error. I... I don't know how many thousands and thousands of hours I've got on the lathe now, and it, it does take some time to develop your skills. This week we're going to try this. This is from Hunter Tools, and full disclosure, I did try this off camera once, and it really scared me. It I got a really bad catch with it, 
and kind of put it back burner. And I said, no, on this piece, I'm going to give this a try and, and see how it works. And I was like, wow, this thing works great. So <laughs> I, I don't know what happened the first time that I used it, but uh, I was a little gun shy after using it. And I was like, well, I don't know if, if I want to go down this road again. The only issue that I was having, you can see the tear out on the very top of the vase. So I figured that I would just taper that off with the gouge and then go back to using the, uh, the scraper. So that's my wood turning education in a nutshell. I did not have the luxury of going to a wood turning club in my area where we live. Uh, there is two in Ottawa. We're close to Ottawa, so but the problem is I believe they're on the other side of Ottawa, so that's a two hour trip one way. So that's another reason why I've never actually gone to any of those meetings there. Um, but if you are getting into wood turning, the very, very first thing you should do is do a wood turning club search and see if you can find a club in your area. The biggest problem that I had with this cutter was it kept moving on me and if you've noticed there's actually I have two of these cutters. So what I did was I put it on the back side of where the washer is and that way it would give me even clamping pressure down onto the uh, the cutter or the, the arm that the cutter is in. Uh, so what I would really like to see, and I'll, I'll talk to Mike on this and see if it's even doable or not, but I'd like to see like a large washer with a slot cut in it to hold that cutter. And then of course a through hole where you can just clamp it down onto the, um, the boring bar. That would be ideal, I would think, and that should keep it from moving around. Of course, it'd have to be a little bit um, not as tall as the bar on the cutter itself. But yeah, there, there I am checking it again, and it, it's just... It was just a constant thing and it you know it wasn't really as long as you kept an eye on it <laughs> then uh, you were good but of course if it moves and you don't catch it that it moved then of course you go through the side of your of your project that you're working on uh but anyway i i'm really glad that i went back to this thing and, and kind of <laughs> what put me here was i had the teardrop cutter that comes with this system from one way was getting, I had sharpened it so much that it was actually getting short and it was affecting its use. So that's why I really decided to use these. I actually did order another teardrop cutter and I'll, I'll try to show that maybe at the end of this video if I think about it. And um, there's quite a difference in the size of it. So that explains a lot there too. But anyway, this is something that we'll see more of in the future. And um, again, I'm glad I got it in my inventory. one thing that I will tell you about this and this is this is for retrofitting if, if you're on the hunter tools systems website it's under the retrofit section and because of the way that the cutter is positioned it tends to want to pull the rig into the base so once you get used to that then I find that it actually makes the tool easier to use so that's one oddity that you typically won't have with a lot of other uh, hollowing tools that's for sure but uh, anyway it left me a really nice surface uh, prior to sanding I left this in here just to give you a, a good shot of what it looks like and and how I was <laughs> how he was clamping it down onto the boring bar itself so this is the laser attachment, a uh, little bit of footage here on this. And if you haven't seen this before, essentially the laser 
between the laser and the cutter is set at say a half inch and when the laser drops off the side of the piece then that means you've achieved your wall thickness and the other thing too that I want you to take note of when you look at the shavings that are coming out of this it it's cutting so cleanly that it was actually clogging up inside so, so you know that that's a great thing you definitely want that but uh, remember to shut the lathe off regularly and get rid of those shavings because what can happen is the boring bar itself can get caught up in it and then it'll lift the boring bar and slam it back down on the tool rest. Since there was no steady rest, this uh, <laughs> there was a little bit of chatter associated with this. And in that previous clip, I don't know if you noticed it or not, but when I basically let the pressure off, you can see the boring bar starting to move down into the base of the uh, of the of the little vase here. So you know, once again, when you're aware of that, then I I I don't know. I found that there being a little bit of a pull on that tool actually helped me steady it for some reason you wouldn't think that you wouldn't think that would be the case but it was anyway that's kind of my impression of it so i actually just uh stopped this voiceover and called mike and said hey uh any chance that um you can maybe make something like this so i explained to him what i was kind of looking for and and he's going to look into it. So hopefully that will be something that he can add to his retrofit line. You'd have to make, I guess, two different sizes because it got a quarter inch and a three sixteenths. I don't even know which one this is. I think this might be the smaller one, the three sixteenths inch one. Anyway, we're almost getting to our, to our final wall thickness. It's still a little thick in the base. So that still has got to, got to remove some material there. But it won't be long before we're moving on to sanding. This is a cool look inside that <laughs> we typically don't get a get a chance to look at. Um, I was saying that you know this is going to save my back, but the, the temptation to bend over and look inside is too great. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, it, it's better than kind of wrestling with a tool. Uh, this would be tough to do because of the depth of it. So there's a, there'd be a lot of tool overhang and a lot of well. A lot of fighting the tool, so the the captive system is certainly the way to go. So the last thing that I want to do here is just finish shaping the top. Uh, we're the the top piece of the walnut joined to the resin. I found that it just, I was having a hard time cutting that clean through that transition. So that's mainly what I'm doing with the Hercules here. And just some very light cuts along the bottom and all the way out to the top. Finally on the sanding, these are the three and a half inch dipple discs from sandpaper.ca. Uh, just like all of my other sponsors, there are links in the description below the video. To take you to their site and you can get uh, some money back in your pocket. So just use code inlay gym at checkout a little bit of hand sanding on the inside of this i do find that it, it's very tough to work inside of these pieces to get them perfectly flat so initially with the 60 grit i'll flatten the inside perfectly and then from then on i'll probably power sand with the odd bit of time sanding with other grits as well so sanded from 60 to 800, and this is the triple E buffing compound from the BL buffing system. And we'll get ready to go to our first coat of finish after we get things cleaned up with the denatured alcohol. Yucky. Well, all right, here comes the best part. First coat of Waterlux gloss.
Well, what do you think of that? I think it's awesome. I was a little worried that the hypershift wasn't going to show up, and you know, it's it's certainly not as prevalent as it was with the black piece that we just did, but right there, hoping the camera is going to pick that up, but maybe not. I can definitely see it when I look at it, but camera is not really picking it up all that great. There's the inside. Very happy with the inside. And I just love them sweet gum pods. Can't use enough of them. All right, well, we'll see you tomorrow for the second coat. Tell me what you think in the comments on this beautiful bowl. Shallow haze, whatever you want to call it. This is the next day, and this time around, we're going to use some 6-0 steel wool. Yes, that's right. Not 4-0 steel wool, 6-0 steel wool. And if you're curious where I got this from, it came from a company in the province of Quebec called Ardec. I thought that I would try this this week, and the main reason for that is I'm finding that because walnut is very porous, uh, the few times that I've used it here recently, I just know that the finish looks like it's getting really heavy. So I'm hoping with the 6-0 steel wool, it'll knock that down better than the triple E buffing compound. And I'm very happy with the finish. Good morning, this is the second coat of Waterlux Gloss. Well, there it is in its second coat. Beauty. I was a little worried about the yellow and this was one of the reasons why I shot this video <laughs> to give me more confidence to use colors like yellow. Again, those sweet gum pods in there just look so cool. All right, and the hyper shift, I don't know if the camera is going to pick it up or not. But it's there. All right, well, if there's a third coat, I will do it the same as this one. And we'll see you when we're doing the bottom. Hopefully you've enjoyed this week's video. And uh, thanks a lot for watching. I really do appreciate it. Let's have a last little chat about this beautiful little pot. I absolutely love this thing. Well, what do you think about this week's project? I can't get enough of these sweet gum pods. They're just absolutely awesome, just full of character. Thanks again to Donna from, for sending those along. Certainly do appreciate it. There's the inside. Three coats of Waterlux gloss. And that black walnut is absolutely awesome. Here's the bottom. As per normal, we're running out of time here. So that will still need probably a couple coats of finish and it will be ready to go to its new home and this piece is sold. I will give you the dimensions on this. I'll put the metric conversion up on the screen. So at its widest point, it's six and a quarter inches across, five and a half inches tall, and it's about your typical half inch thickness, which I like to do with these resin pieces, most of my pieces. Uh, really, really love this piece. The hyper shift is in there. I know it's, I'm hoping it in the rotating footage at the end, we'll be able to pick that hyper shift up, but I can see it, but the camera's just, I don't know, maybe it's picking it up a little bit. But uh, lighter colors, I can definitely see where darker colors make the hyper shift really pop, that's for sure. Uh, okay, so that's this. Now, the teardrop cutter <laughs> that I got. So, I was having issues with, with this teardrop cutter, and there you can see the size of it. And what I think was happening was 
it's rounded over too much and it's exposed a lot of edge. So when you expose a lot of edge on a tool like that, there's a chance that you can get a really bad catch. So I decided to order a new one. <laughs> and uh, it's funny, I've had this for years and you just don't think about these things. And that's the difference between the old one and the new one. It is a lot bigger. And as you can see, it comes to a much more a finer point. So it's less likely to catch because of it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I've never replaced it. But there's the difference in size. Just crazy. Here, maybe that'll show it better. So anyway, keep that in mind if you're using um, uh, scraping tools like this inside of your hollow forms. And the last thing is the retrofit. Uh, like I said, you know, like I, I got gun shy of this thing and I just kind of put it on the back burner and I'm glad that I tried it again. It actually, it actually worked really good, like better than, better than the teardrop cutter. The problem is I have a problem with this down in the very bottom of the hollow form. That's where the teardrop cutter works a lot better than this. But when you're coming up the sides, this here is fantastic. And then along the top too, it, it actually works really, really well. And um, anyway, Hunter Tool Systems, link in the description. Don't forget to use my code if you decide to get one of these. Check it out. Don't forget to put Design Epoxy in the comments down below to be entered into the three gallon giveaway at three, no, at 110,000, 3,000, gee, don't want to hit the, the reset button too far on that. At 110,000, we're going to do another draw. So thanks again for Designer Epoxy uh, for doing that. And of course, that's only for continental USA and Canada. And along with that, don't forget about the promotion that Designer Epoxy has on my channel. Five free colored bags, 10% off your order and free shipping within continental USA and Canada. Fantastic deal. Uh, next week is going to be... Well, I already did a short on it as to what it's going to be. And there's been a lot of, um, a lot of people have commented on what they think it's going to be. It's getting there and it's spectacular. It's one of the nicest things I've made. So I'm not going to give, I'm not going to spoil it any more than that. So please come on back next week and check that out. It's really, truly a beautiful thing. So anyway, hopefully we'll see you next week. Take care, stay safe, don't forget the bell. Please share my videos with your friends. That is the largest way for me to build my presence here on YouTube. And just remember that you guys are awesome and hopefully we'll see you next week. Take care.